Uh, welcome to uh, the New America Foundation. Uh, I'm Peter Bergen. I run the International Security Program here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Larry Wright, um, who's known to all of you as the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Looming Tower. Um, today he's uh, coming here to discuss his new book, uh, which uh, is a collection of his essays over the past decade and a half uh, since the 9-11 attacks, <coughs> the focus on terrorism. Uh, I think some of these pieces are amongst the best pieces ever written uh, on, on the subject. Uh, two in particular stand out for me. Uh, the 20,000 word profile of Ayman al-Zawari I think was uh, uh, the definitive account of uh, the, the man who after all uh, rose from uh, the number two in al-Qaeda to now the leader of al-Qaeda. Also Larry's recent piece on the ISIS kidnappings I think was absolutely definitive and was a, uh, a very uh, somber window into the real world of ISIS and, uh, and a way of telling the larger ISIS story through these particularly focused uh, stories of the Americans who were kidnapped and then later murdered by ISIS. So I'm going to turn it over to Larry. He's going to talk for about some of the big themes and stories of the new book, and then we'll have a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> I'll stand up for a moment while we're... Um, I was... Um, I, I guess I'll start with... Uh, Something that was personal to me, I, 1998, I was co-writer of a movie called The Siege. Uh, Denzel Washington, uh, Bruce Willis, Annette Bening, and Tony Shalhoub. And um, it came out in November of 1998. Now, if you remember, in, when I was writing it, Al-Qaeda had not yet struck America. But... Um, the, uh, I was, had been asked to write about a woman in the CIA, and so what, is it, what would I write about? The Cold War was over, and I was puzzled about, you know, where I would begin on this. Um, and so I realized finally that the CIA had a real-life antagonist, and it was the FBI. <laughs> um, and th at the time, they were fighting over who was going to control terrorism in the U.S. So that became, you know, uh, Annette Bening was the woman in the CIA, and Denzel Washington was um, the, the FBI agent. Um, and I, I, the trailers on this movie came out in August of 1998, right after the embassy bombings in East Africa, the first attack on America. Uh, and I had, you know, in the movie I had the script I had written, the question was, what would happen if terrorism came to America the same way that it had already visited Paris and London? What if it happened in New York? So that was what the movie was about. And um, then in that same month in August after the embassy bombings, there was another bombing that people don't remember uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, a planet Hollywood was bombed. Uh, two people were killed. A little girl lost her leg. And the radical Islamist group that had claimed credit said they did it because of the siege. The trailers were just appearing in America and already two people were dead because of something I wrote. It was a very difficult period for me. And so terrorism had already visited me in a way uh, before 9-11. Uh, and it, that movie was, by the way, a box office failure. Uh, the, uh, it, it, was, it received a lot of criticism from Arab and Muslim groups who had felt that they were, you know, they'd been stereotyped by Hollywood. And I felt very much the opposite. I thought that this was not a stereotype. In fact, Tony Shalhoub played an Arab-American detective. He was a hero in the movie. I don't think that had ever happened in American cinema before, but there were pickets outside the theaters. And people didn't want to go to see the movie. And after 9-11, it was the most rented movie in America, making me the first profiteer in the war on terror. <laughs> um, but there was, people called it prophecy, 
because what I imagined would happen happened. Attacks came to the United States. Uh, in the movie, we rounded up Muslims and tortured them. Uh, all this seemed like a creepy kind of prophecy. There was another weird thing for me personally, which was the, the figure that Denzel Washington played in real life was John O'Neill, and who became uh, one of the most important figures in my book, The Looming Tower, and his story is told in this book. And while I was researching that, I'd been talking to FBI agents, and I heard about this young Lebanese-American uh, FBI agent who, who was undercover, and I couldn't talk to him. But just knowing that such a person existed, I based the Tony Shalhoub character on him, and that was Ali Soufan, uh, who was, became the case agent for the USS Cole bombing and is, uh, is the man who revealed the identities of the hijackers uh, through his skillful interrogation of al-Qaeda members in Yemen. Uh, so there was this weird prescience uh, about the movie but also an echo in my own life that I find still very puzzling. I've thought a lot about recently um, the 15th anniversary, and um, so many, you know, Peter and I were talking about how we never thought we'd still be writing about terrorism 15 years later. But, um, you know, I. It's a subject, unfortunately, that I think has at least another good 15 years in it. Um, I've had many, many adventures in the course of writing these, these articles. I, uh, I used to live in Cairo. I taught English at the American University when I was a young man. And um, I, I studied Arabic not for any other reason than just for fun. I didn't realize how consequential uh, living in an Arab and Muslim country would be later in my life. I wish I'd taken it more seriously then. Uh, but I went back to Cairo uh, after 9-11 to, to write about Zawahri. And uh, it was a heartbreaking period of time for me. This was a country I loved. Uh, I adored my students. I had a wonderful time in Cairo. And uh, when I went back, there was so much anger. Uh, and I was practically the only Westerner in this whole, for <laughs> five years, I felt like I was alone in the Middle East. Um, and so a lot of, there was a lot of hostility. Um, and I couldn't, I was puzzled about why this culture I love so much was attacking the culture that I was a part of. Um, I traveled, uh, you know, I was looking for members of Al-Qaeda that I could talk to. And uh, <coughs> I, I know that you know Bin Laden had lived in Sudan for four years, from '92 to '96. So I, I went to I went to Khartoum, and um, I I was pressing my Sudanese intelligence contacts to help me, help me find me stuff, and they would take me around and say, "That's Bin Laden's house," and drive on by. But I I need a little more than that, and so I was staying in this this hotel that called itself the Hilton. <laughs> And uh, one day I got a knock on the door. And at the time, I'd been traveling so much, I had back trouble. And I had, you know those rubber balls you blow up and sit on? You know, I, I was carrying that around with me. It's a lot of trouble to blow up and every time you land. But um, <laughs> there was a, at the door was one of my Sudanese intelligence contacts. And this guy, uh, kind of pudgy little guy with uh, one of those Indonesian uh, m Muslim hats, conical hats, you know, and uh, he had kind of a, a savoir faire about him, a little ironic. And uh, so he came in and I let him sit in the office chair that was at the desk. And the intelligence agents, his eyes were bobbing. He was so tired. And I said, Ahmed, just go to sleep. So. He goes to sleep, and he leaves me there with this Al-Qaeda member. And uh, I'm sitting on the ball and talking to him, and I said, who are you? He said, well, you can call me Loe. And um, 
okay, uh, and I started talking to him about bin Laden and about Al Qaeda. He knew everything. He was the greatest source. I was, I was ecstatic, but I didn't know who he was, and uh, and you know how do how do I know he is who he says he is, and um, but he would tell me about the founding of Al Qaeda and how he was ribbing bin Laden. He was always cracking jokes this way. Um, you know, and I told him, Osama, you know, if you want to go take these people to battle, how are you going to get them there? Air France? Ha, 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 ha. He might even have slapped his knee. And um, so finally, uh, the intelligence agent woke up and they left. And I went back to America and tried to find out who is this guy. And through some research, I found the name Muhammad Loe Bayazid, who is. Abu Rida al Suri in Al Qaeda. And uh, he was the guy who took the notes when Al Qaeda was founded. And he was also bis bin Laden's business manager in the Sudan. So no wonder he was such a wonderful source. So I went back immediately to Khartoum, and he wouldn't see me. And uh, I finally went back a third time. And I said, Loe, it's a lot of trouble to come to Sudan. Why didn't you see me last time? He said, well, I didn't know how seriously to take you, because the last time we met, you were sitting on a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction to Al Qaeda. I finally got into Saudi Arabia after a year and a half of trying to get in as a journalist. I took a job as an expat worker. And um, that was a fascinating period for me, because uh, Usually, if you're a reporter, you're in a hotel, you're making calls, you're trying to f set up interviews, you hire a fixer, you know, those are the, that's the drill. In this case, I had a job, I had a car, I had to go to work every day. Um, I lived in a middle class Saudi flat, and I had all these young reporters teaching me more about their culture than I could ever have learned on my own as that, that reporter in the Hilton. Some of the things that I learned about Saudi Arabia kind of surprised me. Um, one is that the level of depression uh, is so stark. Uh, one of my reporters did a study of depression at King Abdulaziz University, which is bin Laden's alma mater. I don't remember exactly what the figures were, but I, I remember that a majority of the students at the university had profound symptoms of depression. And one of, the, one of the things I found, I remember quite vividly, 7% of the, st of the female students admitted that they had attempted suicide. This in a strict Muslim country where suicide is a <coughs> horrific taboo and that they would admit it, uh, this, this really struck me. Some of my reporters were very depressed. Uh, and it, I realized you know, that this is just one of many tributaries, depression, in this great river of despair that runs through the Arab and Muslim worlds. We've tried to find the roots of terrorism and, and radicalization and why people uh, become radicals and, and go into these movements, and nobody knows. Uh, you can cite poverty. Uh, lack of education, lack of uh, employment opportunities, gender apartheid, uh, tyranny, and there's a long list of probable causes. And yet if you take each one of them by themselves, it's not sufficient. So in my experience, uh, you, these are all tributaries in this river of despair. And depression is certainly one of them. Now. Um, in the book, I spend some time, several chapters, uh, writing about the evolution of Al Qaeda's philosophy and the wars, ideological wars going on inside uh, these movements, uh, and how how the jihadist enterprise has changed over the years, um, but. I also write about how America has changed. I was in Saudi Arabia in 2003 when we invaded Iraq. I was ambivalent. 
I had in a in a symposium at the New Yorker I had vocally opposed the invasion, but the truth was, I I wasn't sure. Uh, my family, my wife was in Austin, my son was in Chicago, my daughter was studying in Italy, and they were all involved in protest marches in those three areas. And I was in Saudi Arabia, much closer to the action, but every Saudi was telling me that, are you nuts? Iraq? Why would you do this? And you know, this was not something I was hearing from American policymakers. It, of all the countries in the Middle East, they were saying Iraq is the last place you should go. On the other hand, weapons of mass destruction. I was, I did not believe that my government would lie to me about it. And I thought, you know, it's dangerous to have Saddam Hussein with having weapons of mass destruction. And I was affected by Colin Powell going to the United Nations and telling the UN that Saddam Hussein had these weapons and that he was working with Al Qaeda. He was an honorable man. And I thought that was dangerous. I didn't know where the information came from. But that particular information came from a man named Ibn Sheikh Al Libi, who um, had not been a member of Al Qaeda. He ran a training camp in Afghanistan. Um, but he was not the high level Al Qaeda figure that the government thought he was. Um, the FBI was interrogating him, getting useful information when the CIA snatched him and sent him to Egypt. At the time, we didn't torture our own suspects. We sent them elsewhere. And um, Michael Scheuer, who was the head of the Alex station, uh, once said about Egypt, the nice thing is you send them there in the morning and you get the answers in the afternoon. And in that afternoon, the answers came back. Yes, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and he was colluding with Al Qaeda. Um, so America was changing behind the curtain. Um, I didn't know, we didn't know about Abu Ghraib, we didn't know about waterboarding. Uh, but America was becoming a different country. And jihad was also changing. Now, we often think of ISIS being an evolution of Al Qaeda. I think it's more accurate to think of them as twins. They were really born at the same time. When I was working on this book, um, I was curious about the fact that Al Qaeda had so few people from Jordan, Syria, Palestine, uh, Lebanon, uh, the Levant. Where were they? It was mostly an Egyptian organization with a Saudi head on it. But where were all these other people? Weren't they also capable of being radicalized? And I found that there was another camp in Afghanistan established about the same time as that Al Qaeda camp, run by a man named Abu Musab al Zarqawi. And bin Laden kept him at arm's distance, although he did give him money. Um, but they had different, they were different people, bin Laden and Zarqawi. Bin Laden was an international businessman. Uh, Zawahri was a, a, a surgeon. So you know those were the kind of people that were going into Al Qaeda at that point. Zarqawi was a criminal. He was a street thug. Um, he had a different way of organizing his 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 group. He also had different goals. Um, for Bin Laden, the establishment of the caliphate was a distant goal. For Zarqawi, it was urgent. It had to be done now. Uh, for bin Laden, uh, the idea of organizing in Iraq seemed implausible because it was a majority uh, Shiite country. And Al Qaeda is an entirely Sunni organization. Why would you do that? But Zarqawi saw opportunity there because, in part, he wanted to create a civil war inside Islam by killing as many Shiites as you can. So ISIS, the, former, the pre precursors to ISIS, it was overshadowed by, um, by Al Qaeda. Although they had, there were places where they converged. Uh, Amr Azizi, I think his name was, in Spain, was a part of the Zarqawi network. He helped Mohammed Atta when he was in Spain and also uh, was one of the architects of the Madrid bombing. Uh, 
Uh, we weren't paying a whole lot of attention to Zarqawi's network until after our invasion in 2003 of Iraq, which created so much chaos and, and a security vacuum that allowed uh, ISIS uh, in its formative stage uh, to come into bloom. Now, um, there were battles between Al Qaeda and ISIS, uh, or you know, at that time it became Al Qaeda in Iraq, a formal affiliate of Al Qaeda. But it was Zarqawi was very frustrating to Zawahiri in particular, who would send him letters saying, "Do you have to behead them? Can't you just shoot them?" And you know, who, the idea of killing all the Shiites seems so implausible. ISIS flourished in part because Al Qaeda was so pinned down, and Zarqawi was able to, uh, to range across uh, the country and, and create such mayhem. And it became a, very, a great attractor to alienated young Muslims who wanted to get into the action. In the end of the book, I talk about how terrorism comes to an end. And I, I rely to some extent on Audrey Kurth Cronin, who teaches at George Mason here in Washington. Uh, she's done a study of more than 400 terrorist organizations. And she found that the average lifespan of terrorist organization is eight years. Well, Al Qaeda just celebrated its 28th birthday. Uh, Hezbollah's 34, I think. I mean, these are long lasting uh, by the standards of terrorism. Um, Unfortunately, religious-based terrorist organizations tend to have to be more durable. There was one, the Hindu thugs, that lasted for 600 years. So I think that'll outlast uh, even Peter and me. <laughs> um, now, how do they, how do they come to an end? Well, decapitation is the neatest way of doing it. It worked really well with Om Shinrikyo, uh, and I think we should sometimes we tend to think of terrorism and Islam in the same sentence. You know, this was a blind Japanese yoga instructor. You know, you don't know where the genie of terror is going to land all the time. And I think Aum Shinrikyo, if, if left unstopped, could have been a more dangerous organization than Al Qaeda because of the te technical proficiency within that organization and their intent to murder everybody they could. Um, but capturing uh, Yoko Asahara didn't put an end to the organization, but it, but it eliminated it as a threat. The same was true of the Shining Path in Peru. But we killed bin Laden. We killed Zarqawi. It didn't stop either of those organizations. So decapitation, in that case, didn't work. Negotiation. Uh, I was interested to hear Petraeus a few months ago was talking about negotiating with Nusra. And, um, I still don't think that's likely, or e I'm not sure it's even wise. But uh, I, I, the trouble with ISIS and Al Qaeda is that these are apocalyptic organizations that uh, that have goals that are simply unnegotiable. So I don't think that we can treat them like the IRA and hope that they might come to the bargaining table. Uh, oftentimes, terror organizations evolve into something else, like political parties or criminal organizations. I think the Taliban could go either way, or maybe both. Um, it's a myth that terror organizations never succeed. Um, Irgun, under Menachem Begin, was a formidable terror organization that succeeded in large part in driving the British out of mandated Palestine, and then, of course, driving Palestinians out of the West Bank. Um, when American troops went into Kandahar uh, in November 2001, they found a copy of Begin's autobiography in bin Laden's compound. Uh, I think he was trying to study how did Begin make the leap from being a terrorist leader to a prime minister to the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Nelson Mandela also modeled the terrorist arm of the African National Congress on Irgun. So this was a formidable template 
for terrorists in the future. Um, I don't see Al Qaeda or ISIS uh, achieving success. Most, uh, you know, in Russia, repression, you know, in, in tyr tyrannical societies like Egypt during the 90s, uh, they can apply so much repression. They can actually just murder everybody in sight and lock up the few that, are, that survive. America is not that kind of society. So repression is not the best. There's only one other way that terrorist organizations end, and that is failure. And most terror organizations do fail. Sometimes it takes a lot of time. And I think um, that one day, Al Qaeda and ISIS will go away. Now, they have created a template, however, for organizations in the future, um, for highly powered, highly empowered individuals or s small groups to try to affect history. I worry about the addition of new forms of technology. Um, I talked to one guy in the intelligence community, sort of the Q of, uh, they didn't show me any of the gear, unfortunately, but uh, uh, he said that one of his concerns was that high school students that are now making computer viruses will soon be able to manufacture biological viruses. Um, we have drones flying over the White House fence. These are technical innovations that are, offer tremendous opportunities for, for terrorists who have a mind to put them to use. The other thing that I'm most concerned about is this vast pool of refugees. Um, you remember I talked about despair um, being this blanket uh, t uh, term that I use to, to uh, talk about the causes of terrorism. The entire Palestinian diaspora was 750,000 people. Five million Syrians uh, out of their country. Um, Two million in Turkey, a million in Jordan, you know, one out of four people in Lebanon. These are our regional allies in the region, and that kind of demography could be enough to capsize those countries' governments. And not to mention the flow into Europe, and look at the political consequences there in, in our own country. Um, but the main problem we have is these young people inside that flow, according to UNICEF, um, only 20% of them are getting an education. So if you're a five-year-old child in 2011 in Syria, you've already missed your entire elementary school education. What future is there for you? It's already been blighted. That is a huge reservoir of despair and a problem for the future. Now, I'm going to end with one thought about America. Um, in 1965, I took a date to the airport in Dallas. Um, you could do that then. It's called Love Field, so that doesn't think has anything to do with it. But, uh, but you know, if you didn't have any money uh, and you wanted to go out and entertain uh, your date, we went out to the airport. We walked out on the tarmac. We went into one of these international jetliners that had just flown in. We decided from Paris or some lovely port of call. And we got into the first cabin, first class cabin. We sat down. One of the stewardesses, as we called them then, brought us a snack. And we sat there pretending to be cosmopolitan and uh, imagining you know, where we'd be traveling. And then we went out and we climbed up into the FAA tower. And I opened the unlocked door and, come on in, kids. And we sat down and watched the planes landing. That America's dead. <laughs> Terrorism killed it. And what I worry about, these wars have gone on for 15 years. Many people in this room have never known that America. Um, and this community of trust and security that once was our birthright. And they don't know, young people, that you, that you could walk into office buildings without having your 
picture made, or you could go visit the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia without having to take off your shoes and your belt. These are small liberties, but they are liberties, and we talk about fighting for our liberties. We are surrendering so many of those. I think we tend to forget what the founders of our country were facing when they wrote uh, into the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. They were facing the greatest superpower on Earth, the Great Britain, and they created freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of to be left alone by your government. So many of these things are under attack, and, and I'm not saying that we can withdraw all of the cautions that we have put into place. I'm not saying that we can't walk through the TSA line anymore. I'm not saying those things, but I am saying that if we forget that America, then in some respects, terrorism really will have won. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, Larry, thank you. And um, to picking up on, so I'll, the prognosis for ISIS and Al Qaeda in the, in, the, in the long or medium term is is not particularly good. Uh, you'd agree. Yeah. But the uh, and I think you said some of this in what you. But it seems to me there are five drivers, uh, and we were talking about this before. You know, when, when bin Laden died and the Arab Spring happened, it seemed that this phase of, of terrorism being a central national security concern was going away. That's what I felt, and I you felt too, the same yeah. way. So if we look at the, what is really driving ISIS is a, is a symptom of problems that is not the problem itself. And the, the five big problems, I think, are a Sunni-Shia regional civil war, the collapse of Arab governance, the massive wave of immigration to Europe as a result of problems one and two, the, the continued and likely increasing alienation of Muslim populations in Europe, and the rise of European proto-fascist parties that mm -hmm. are related to it. So if that, is that, is that a correct picture? These are the things that are driving this? I agree with all that, yeah. So, and would you also agree that none of these things are gonna, I mean, problems one, two, three, four, five are unlikely to be magically yeah. go away no. anytime soon. So if that's true, you come to a rather pessimistic conclusion, which is uh, we luckily are protected here by geography and also mm -hmm. by the American dream, which has worked pretty well for American Muslims. But we're looking at a situation where for several, probably at least one or two more decades, I would say, we're gonna have some kind of, we don't know what the name of this group is, right now it's called ISIS, but some version of this is gonna, it's gonna continue to impact Europe and the Middle East going forward. Right which is kind of a sobering place to be. It is. And, you know, I think that, you know, we have to get used to having terror be like crime. Uh, it's, a, it's a constant background problem. We're gonna, we can't be, we can't afford to be surprised if we have new terrorist episodes. We will have them. Um, so we need to be uh, resolute about that kind of thing, but not go crazy as a country. I, since I'm from Texas, I'll tell you that it's an mm -hmm. anecdote of something that happened the other day in Texas that I think captures the state of mind in Alpine, which is in far west Texas, a little town. There was a tragedy, a real tragedy. A 14-year-old girl went to high school and shot another girl and then killed herself, mm -hmm. which is a sad story. But it was a school shooting, and so um, the police came, the deputy sheriff came, and Homeland Security came, and it was so much confusion that the deputy shot one of the Homeland Security guys, and then there were these anonymous bomb threats posted by the LOL crowd, and um, meantime in Marathon, just down the highway, um, there, there was a couple in a motel room, and they posted a, a do not, hand letter, do not disturb sign, uh, and then in parenthesis, La Bomba. And so the panic manager called the police and the Homeland Security and all this sort of thing. Turns out La Bomba is Tex-Mex for hot sex. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm sure it cooled <laughs> off when the Homeland Security <laughs> opened it. <laughs> but that, to me, that's just like, that's where we are right now. Yeah, well, it's not a good place to be. I mean, do the thought experiment in that school shooting where one of the female perpetrators shouted Allah Akbar in the middle of it. How, how, would, that, how would that have changed the media 
uh, government and societal reaction to that story, which I'm presuming no one in this room has heard of. No. Right? It but wouldn't, it, unless it happened under your scenario, it wouldn't have traveled that far. But with the Allah Akbar, it would be, yeah. suddenly it's a national yeah. story. Yeah. So why are, I mean, the rise of Trump is very much associated, I think, with uh, clearly fears about terrorism, the Muslims, putting in a sort of, I mean, why is he, Europe, you live in Austin, which is probably not a hotbed of uh, Trumpism, relatively speaking, to other parts of Texas. But um, there are some Trumpites there. <laughs> why is, why, I mean, is it because 9-11 was a hinge event in American history and therefore we're just not just having, even 15 years later, we still, what, what, is, what is driving this sort of paranoia uh, that's reflected in the rise of Trump to some degree, but is also a real concern of, you know, I think recent polls suggest that Americans are uh, as concerned about terrorism today as they were in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, which is very paradoxical right. because so few Americans are killed by terrorists. Yeah, and, and so many of them are killed simply by handguns. Or, right. Uh, you know, uh, the number of people, you know, these statistics have been out there again and again about lightning strikes and, all, you know, the, the, your chances of being killed by a terrorist are remote. And yet look at all the national expenditure that we put into this and the cautions. I'm not saying, you know, Unfortunately, I think we do have to live with a lot of these changes because a single attack on an airplane would have devastating consequences for the trust in our, in our uh, air safety. Although, if you look back in the 70s, hi planes were hijacked all the time. You there, always were, there were 100 hijackings in this country in the 1970s. And they all wound up in Cuba or someplace like yeah. that. And now. Uh, so, there, so the other things were a historical. I mean, his terrorism was sort of endemic. There weren't yeah. a lot of fatalities, but the 70s was the Weather Underground, Black Panthers. Right. I think part of what uh, has happened that is this this brilliant use of imagery. Um, when you know, when when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, went to Bin Laden, first of all, with his planes uh, plan. Um, he had the idea that let's hijack uh, a dozen American uh, airplanes in, in, in Asia, and I'll fly one of them, and we'll kill all the men, and then we'll fly and uh, land in the U.S., and, uh, and then I will make a declaration about jihad. And I think he wound up with killing myself at the end, but I don't know if the College mm -hmm. Sheikh Mohammed had that in mind. But, but bin Laden was like, yeah, there's something. It reminds me of a movie <laughs> producer. You got something there, but uh, you know, work on it a little bit. So that was the the origin of the of of, of 9/11. And if in the siege I had pictured airliners flying into the World Trade Center, it would not have been believable. Mm. It was too Hollywood. And uh, but that image and we couldn't stop watching it. And we traumatized ourselves again and again by watching it, and that was purposeful, but it also it lit up uh, young despairing Muslims who felt that they had no way of contributing uh, to history. And here was Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, making a mockery of the greatest power on earth. ISIS, I think, has been in competition with that image. Mm -hmm. And that's the beheading stuff. Is, then now I think you get less of it because it's losing some of its power and they're probably struggling to find how can we create imagery that will once again spread all across the world. Uh, you know, the murder of Jim Foley, which you told, was the most, um, the people poll on this question, I didn't realize this, but which news story do you pay most attention to? And more Americans paid attention to the Jim Foley story than any other story in the previous five years. I think for this imagery reason. That's exactly right, and it's so shocking and so horrifying, and it haunts your dreams, and um, it, and it is also beautifully shot. Mm. You know, the stark desert, the colors of the sky, everything was, uh, you know, they'd rehearsed that so many times, apparently, um, that, you know, probably they were <coughs> looking for, you know, how to set it up correctly and the posture uh, the speeches that each of them would make. And so when it finally was done, uh, one has to sadly conclude that they did a brilliant job. 
there's one uh, English hostage still alive, John Cantilly, yeah. um, who has become an ISIS propagandist. Do you, did you, I can't recall if you wrote much about him in the article, but why, I mean, is he just doing what he can to survive? Well, I, th I would do the same. I probably, yeah. you know, if, if I were in his spot, I, I, so I can't answer. I, but there is the Stockholm Syndrome, which is so, you know, th you know that he could be the Patty Hearst of, uh, mm. of ISIS. Um, the, 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 he's diminished so much in their propaganda. I worry that he's um, maybe next is his head on the block, but um, I think he's probably saved himself. Uh, although I wonder what life will be like for him if he's ever freed. Yeah. Um, so looking, looking to the future, I mean, you mentioned there's a, uh, obviously, you know, part of looming, the looming tower and, and the 9-11 commission and other investigations, I mean, the CIA in a way did its job pretty well in terms of strategic warning to, the, to yeah. policymakers. Um, I mean, black swans by their nature are hard to predict, uh, but let's maybe talk about gray swans, which are you know, perhaps easier to think about than black swans. So if you were, uh, when President Hillary Clinton or President Donald Trump goes into office and you were sort of sitting there, what, would, what might you say to him or her about the likely, I mean, things that we should be concerned about? I think you sort of, this question of biological weapons, and there seems to be a Moore's law in biology where things that would have been very complicated to do now, you know, uh, are, are sort of available to more people. And what, what is the, what's a legitimate concern? Because there was a lot, after 9-11, there was a lot of, let's get Hollywood in, let's get them to kind of tell right. us what's going to happen next. And that turned out to be, it was mostly, I mean, you, you were an honorable exception where you did predict what was happening, but that didn't turn out to be a very useful way of looking at things. I mean, so what are the sort of kinds of tactics that you think are, um, that terrorists will employ that are plausible rather than just sort of, well, I, I think more of the Mumbai type attacks yeah. that uh, you know we saw in, in Tampa and San Bernardino. That's hard to stop, yeah. hard to predict, um, easy to do. But if I were really advising um, President Trump, <laughs> can you guess, can you say that directly yourself? It's very hard, two, two words very hard to put together right. in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like trying to put a two magnets at wrong, <laughs> wrong ends together. Uh, we're going to have to get used to it, though. Oh, I know. <laughs> so if I, if I were to advise the, the, the president, I would say, you know, remember that terrorism is not an existential threat to the United States. The big mistakes are the ones we do to ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would... I worry that nobody's been held to account for some of the biggest mistakes, uh, like the failure of intelligence on 9-11. Especially, it still galls me, and I write about it in the book, um, that the CIA uh, failed to tell the FBI that Al-Qaeda was in America in January of 2000, 20 months before 9-11. Um, Actually, I think, kind of, I think we need to make an important distinction, because I think the CIA gave perfect strategic warning in the summer of 2001 something was happening. Yeah. What they didn't do was tell the FBI about these two Al-Qaeda members who were living in California. Uh, it's a point when, when uh, we're, uh, Tenet was saying we're declaring war on, and by the way, he didn't say that there are two Al-Qaeda guys in San Diego. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, because CIA is not supposed to work in this country, uh, they let that go until late August of 2001. And why did they finally tell the FBI? Because they lost them. They didn't know where they were. And where, where do you go when you lose two Al-Qaeda guys? Well, finally, you go say to the FBI, can you find these guys? They might be trouble. Uh, it was a little bit too late. Nobody's been held to account for that. Yeah. And then, the, you know, I'm, I mentioned the Ibn Sheikh al-Libi and the waterboarding and the torture, all of that the laying the predicate for the war in Iraq which yeah. has been the greatest single catastrophe uh, that I, c I can remember in our history. Uh, I mean, let's say the Civil War was worse, but in terms of a blunder, uh, in modern history, there hasn't been anything more consequential. And I, 
setting aside simply the bloodletting, um, we're talking about Afghanistan and Iraq, four to six trillion dollars. Bernie Sanders couldn't have spent all that money. You know, and <laughs> what, what did we do with that money? In Iraq, we invested it in misery, in making chaos, in making more terrorists. Uh, think how much good could have been done in the world. Uh, in, in entire history of cancer research, the government, since the Nixon administration, has only spent $600 billion. Mm -hmm. Six trillion dollars. Uh, you, the average health care tab for the entire country is two and a half trillion dollars a year. There's so much money, that, so much use for good use for that money, and nobody's been held account to account for that either. So if I were advising this president, I would say we have to be more careful about our own behavior. Isn't that kind of the Obama doctrine? Yes. And do nothing stupid. Don't wade into uh, conflicts that you don't have to. Don't go into waging war into regions you poorly understand. Um, that has gotten us into a lot of trouble. Conversely, uh, inaction is a form of action. Yes, in, it is. Uh, and uh, you, in, the, in your new book, you write about, and this is before the uprising in Syria, about a group of Syrian filmmakers. Right. Um, you know, what would those filmmakers say to you now today about Obama? Well, you know, even when I was in Syria, uh, this before Arab Spring, uh, this one Syrian guy said, you know, I wish you would invade us. Mm. And I said, <laughs> are you kidding? You're right next door to Iraq. Have you seen what, you, have you been next door lately to see what happens? I don't care, he said. You know, we live in such misery here. You know, anything, and of course, no, we didn't, but look what happened. Um, I, I confess that I wanted to establish a no-fly zone. Um, that I grew, as a young reporter, I, um, I, I covered the civil rights movement, and I was very affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go to Montgomery, Alabama, there's a <coughs> shrine to the martyrs of the civil rights movement. Um, and there are 40 names on there. You know, Martin Luther King and the, the, the Birmingham church, gir girls in the church. And, you know, but 40 names, it's, you know, to think about what a profound episode in the history of human nature that was. In Cairo, during their Tahrir Square, there were 840 people killed in um, th their 19 days. And then in Syria, there were all these idealistic young people who wanted to make a change in their government. And they, they walked into the face of cannon fire. Uh, you know, it was unbelievably courageous. And yet, and, and I don't know if that could ever have made a change in that government. But as soon as it turned to military conflict, I knew that this was going to be a catastrophe because that government wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, so I thought, you know, we need to create a zone of safety. It was dangerous because Syria was pretty well armed and it has allies. But to try to contain, you know, my feeling about terrorism movement is to try to keep it where it is as much as possible. But uh, now I, I I think that, you know, it's odd. Donald Trump and, and Obama seem to be on the same page with Russia. And um, I'm actually in favor of that. I, th I think um, we tend to overlook how strategically important Syria is to uh, Russia. The Russian border is 600 miles from Syria. That's the distance from Austin to El Paso, to use a Texas analogy. And uh, no wonder they're worried about it. They've got ISIS recruiters all over Moscow. Mm. You know, it, ISIS is full of Russians and Chechens. And, um, so they've got a deep interest in it. And um, uh, I think that that could be uh, a, a, an ad hoc alliance to try to shrink the problem. And there's no question that Assad is a monster, a Stalin. But he doesn't pose a threat to America. And we have to keep in mind our own national interests. Um, 
I'm sure Obama makes horrible decisions all the time. In the case of Jim Foley, um, you know, you remember the Yazidi people who were being mm. exterminated by ISIS and chased up onto that mountain, and suddenly, would anybody come to their aid? And Obama said, we've come to their aid, and he bombed the ISIS troops. And right after that, Jim Foley was beheaded, and it, that video was preceded by imagery of the American bombers. So he was probably doomed already. But Obama made a choice to save thousands of people, putting at the risk of four Americans whose lives eventually were taken. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, how terrorism ends by um, Audrey Kurth Cronin. There's a lot of literature about how civil wars end, um, and it's a mutual recognition of a hurting stalemate. Um, is there a mutual recognition of a hurting stalemate right now in Syria? Well, I hope so. I, you know, there was, um, you know, they're both engaged in a war that neither side can win. Right. And um, and. and Will it split up? You know, I, you know, the truth is dividing up these Middle Eastern countries once again probably won't be any more successful than the first time. Um, but if we can find a way to actually create enough of a lull, then there might be room for people to begin to establish peace. And I think a, an international peacekeeping force with real you know, who are really willing to go into this extremely dangerous situation to hold people at bay, that's, that's a possibility. But then there's the reconstruction. And who's going to pay for it? Uh, you know, these cities are ruined. Uh, and where are those, are those refugees going to come home? Uh, I hope so, but where will they live? And they're going to need, it's going to require a huge investment. Okay, we'll take questions. We'll start with Hazmat, I think, over there. Thank Everybody you. Everybody identify themselves before they... Hi, I'm Asmat Khan, and I'm a Future of War Fellow. Uh, this was really fascinating, and I'm really grateful. And I wanted to ask you specifically about this question of Assad not being a threat to America. I've been thinking a lot about what happened in 2011 when he was required to release political prisoners, and some of them, specifically three, one of whom went on to form Jabhat al-Nusra, and the sort of idea that he has preyed on fears of ISIS and of terrorism, and has actually stoked it. Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts on sort of the context and the rich history you have, on sort of this question of the ways in which Assad has also pushed this conflict further. And, and in, your, in your mind, the magnitude of that versus some of the alternatives you might consider. Thank OK. You. Uh, you know, you're pressing me on an extremely difficult subject. So I'm going to, you know, my response is going to be inadequate. But uh, one lesson I've learned from spending a lot of time in the Middle East is that things can always get worse. So you think you're going to make things better. And um, oftentimes, uh, you know, even your effort uh, stirs things up and makes them worse. Uh, Assad is not just this obstinate leader of Syria, which he is, but he's also the head of the Alawite community, which faces the possibility of actual extinction if, you know, if the country is overrun by Nusra and these other groups. Uh, so no wonder they're fighting for their lives. But it's not just uh, Alawites. There are you know, secular Muslims and Christians and Druze, I mean, there are a lot of minorities and a lot of people that simply don't want this horde to take over their country. Um, another thing I found when I was, I went to Syria for the weirdest reason. Uh, the Middle East is the most valuable place in the world. It's paradise for reporters. People love to talk. And there's not a lot else to do sometimes. And so they'll talk, talk, talk. And you know, that's what I'm there for, is to hear what they have to say. And I realized at one point, Syria was really quiet. And it was like the dog that didn't bark, you know, the hound of the Baskervilles. I said, yeah, what's going on there? You know, and it's not much of a, when I went into my editor and said, you know, what's going on in Syria? And he said, 
I don't hear very much. And that's not a story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the, yeah. So I thought, well, uh, people learn about America through um, our movies. I'll go to Syria and I'll watch the movies and I'll talk to the filmmakers. That, that's what I write about in this book. And uh, see what's, you know, what's going on in their culture. And what I found that they had in common. Every movie and every person that I interviewed in Syria was physical abuse. Everybody had been beaten by their parents or their teacher or the police or the, you know. It was, this kind of abuse was so ingrained in that culture. It was appalling to me. And um, my fixer, uh, a lovely young woman, um, her um, parents had both been in political prison and um, her mother for two and a half years and her father for 13 years. And so when he got out, uh, he'd been tortured, he'd been locked in isolation. And so what did he do when he got out? He beat her up and locked her in her room. Um, she had to go to the hospital several times. You know, this is uh, the level of trauma in that culture and that society before the Arab Spring, before the Civil War, was already so great um, that I don't think the Americans understand um, exactly what they're dealing with. Um, there was a woman I didn't write about in the ISIS story um, who was an Alawite and she ran away to join the revolution and her father said, if you don't come back, I'm going to kill your mother. And she didn't come back, and he killed her mother. Now, I'm not saying that's a representative story, but it is a Syrian story. And I don't think our policymakers clearly understand when they're making a move into a, a culture like that what they might encounter. Henry? Henry Schuster. Um, let's go back to chapter one in your book, which is about Ayman al-Zawari, um, because it relates sort of to the how terrorism might die. Um, imagine, uh, you must have given some thought to what, how he sees the world now, and how he, without even always acknowledging it, has become an anachronism. Yeah. And he looks at them, and he looks at, you know, he's, in one laughable way, kind of like the, um, you know, the guy in Scooby-Doo talking about those meddling kids when it comes to ISIS, because it's a world he no longer relates to or even understands. And is that, I mean, where is the mind of Ayman al-Zawari now? And what does that tell us about, about Al-Qaeda dying now? You know, Henry, I, I don't entirely agree with you. I, I did have that opinion um, a few years ago, but so Wafri, you know, he, had, he had a terrible reputation in, as a terrorist leader. When he had his own group in Egypt, al-Jihad, he ran it into the ground. He, he has no charisma. He's like got anti-charisma. He's got dandruff of the charisma. And he, uh, nobody joins al-Qaeda because they want to be like Ayman al-Zawahri. Um, but he survived. And uh, al-Qaeda core is diminished, but it still has all these affiliates out there uh, that are doing pretty well. And, um, you know, Dick Clark, in some recent story I, I read, estimated that there are you know, 100,000 jihadists in the field now, which is more than there ever been. And they're not all ISIS. Uh, you know, the Al-Qaeda affiliates have a lot of them, and in a way he's still the, at the center of it. So. It, I used to think that, it, that we're, if Al-Qaeda had to have a leader, we were lucky that he was Ayman al-Zawahri. And I still feel that to some extent, but I have to say that he's endured, he's kept that organization intact under, uh, under this enormous pressure for 15 years. Now you taught at the American University in Cairo, yeah. and one of your colleagues was an American convert to Islam who knew Ayman al-Zawahri pretty yeah, well. Abdullah Schleifer, yeah. Okay, tell us about Abdullah Schleifer and his relationship and how that affected your reporting and getting into it? Well, I was really fortunate um, when uh, I went to talk to Abdullah. He was a 
former NBC correspondent, one of your competitors even. <laughs> and uh, he had um, been the bureau chief in, in Cairo. And he knew Zawahri. Uh, he knew when, uh, when Abdullah converted from being a Jewish Marxist to uh, uh, being a, a, a Sufi Muslim, uh, Zawahri's uncle took him in. Mm. Uh, as a kind of sponsor, so he was. He, he knew Ayman, um, and he actually got Ayman to take him around and introduce him to some young people in Cairo University. Um, but um, I'm not sure exactly what point you want me to make. About no, no. I just think <laughs> I. But was it, so you? I mean, it was an int you kind of it was a good way into the family, right? I mean. Oh yeah, and, and you know, it connected to Said Qutb. Um, I, Said Qutb was the, um, I'm always interested in how movements go back to a book. Mm. Uh, you know, you can take Christianity, uh, animal rights, uh, Marxism, you know, at the bottom, you know, keep looking, you'll find <laughs> the Bible of the movement is down yeah. there somewhere. And for radical Islam, it's Ma'alam fil Tariq, which means my signposts along the road. And um, it was uh, written by Said Qutb, this uh, uh, educator in Cairo who had gone to America in the late 40s and early, you know, late 48, I think it was, and uh, came back full of anger and hate for the United States. Um, and for the most obscure reasons, you know, it was. He That's a great scene, and tell, tell us the obscure reason. Well, one of the, maybe the scene you're thinking about is yeah. in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, you can't imagine a more all-American town with churches on every corner and all the nice yards. And, and uh, he was um, studying in Greeley and went to a church social. And uh, in the basement, they had a dance. And um, the, uh, the, the minister had dimmed the lights, and they were playing Baby is Cold Outside which was just uh, in this new Ginger Rogers movie. And um, he was appalled that uh, there was this sort of sexual uh, intimacy in a church of all places. And, and the, the lyrics of the song you know, were uh, horrifying to him. Those were all examples of things. He was an extremely touchy individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, he went back and wrote um, uh, a, a, an influential uh, treatise about America. And then he joined the Muslim Brothers and became its spiritual leader um, and was in prison when he wrote um, signposts or milestones and smuggled out like Samizdat. And it became this incredibly influential document. Ayman al Zawahri's uncle was his lawyer. And um, was very mm -hmm. useful to me, and he was the guy that took Abdullah under his wing. The, um, you know, one of the themes I think that uh, that you lay. I mean, you know, Said Qutb radicalized in prison. I mean, he produced the key work in prison. Ayman al Zawahri emerged after three years, a much more right. embittered. So look at Sisi today. I mean, he's out. He's criminalized the Muslim Brotherhood, which is millions and millions of people. Uh, there was one trial where. 500 people, Muslim brothers, were convicted of the murder of one policeman, right. all sentenced to death. I mean, is this, so if, you, if it's true that, in a sense, Al-Qaeda was, to some degree, baked in the prisons of, uh, of uh, Sadat and Mubarak, yeah. then the future iteration of this is going to be rebaked in the pr prisons of Sisi. Absolutely. So, so th this raises a very interesting kind of political science question, which is total repression re works very, very well. I mean, if you kill everybody and you're, you behave like Stalin. It, it can, yeah. but you know, there's a point at which it becomes counterproductive. And I, I mean, is you know, as somebody who lived in Egypt, I mean, do you think is Sisi going to just be Mubarak too, or is he worse, or what is this? What is this regime? Once you start in the direction of repression, it's very hard to pull back. Yeah. Because you know, there, you've already created all these levels of injustice and anger and resentment, and it's only fear that keeps people from enacting revenge or rising up. And so you, it's, it, it, there's inertia. You have to keep moving forward, because if you stop, you'll be overwhelmed by the backlash. So I don't see him becoming a liberal force. But just on the subject of prisons, I'm curious. Mm. 
I don't think that we're paying enough attention in our own prisons. You know, we have a lot of people, we have more people in prison than any other country. And, uh, and there, there's a lot of organizing going on in there. And I don't think that our police agencies are in our prisons are paying enough attention. Because I think we could have, we've been very blessed with our Muslim community. That's a completely different community than it, you find in Europe. Actually, New America has a database of every terrorism case since 9-11. And we found that prison radicalization is really pretty minor compared to now, obviously, I mean, the amazing statistic here is that the French Muslim population is 8% of their population. The French mu prison population 60. is 60% Muslim. Yeah. So, I mean, that is really a yeah. big issue. And the French, you know, are trying to respond to it by putting people in solitary confinement. And, uh, I mean, there's not a really particularly good response except wave, wave, waging a, waving a magic wand over French society. Um, okay, other questions? This lady in front. Um, Diane Perlman, George Mason School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Um, just two follow-ups on some comments you made. Um, one in terms of lo the longevity of, of um, Al-Qaeda, that I think we need to factor in our retaliation. Um, and Rick McCauley, who was at the start at um, the Center the, for the Study of Terrorism and Reactions to Terror, um, he has a, a framework that um, bin Laden couldn't activate his base. So if he attacks us, then when we retaliate, we activate the base yeah. for them. So that that's just another factor. And their longevity might have been yeah. less if we behave differently. And um, the other point about the reason you talked about despair, um, but other factors are um, like humiliation, moral outrage, and also grievances like I you would put them all in the yeah, category well, US, of US troops yeah. and Muslims land yeah. and also the the physical punishment there's mm -hmm. a whole body of literature right. on that and um, asymmetrical power so I think we need to also look at our policies and how they affect influence the dynamics and thanks you bet uh, this gentleman here <coughs> David Mattingly, uh, freelance writer. Uh, one thing that, just to piggyback on what was just previously said, do, can you comment on the continuing drone uh, program as far as its effect on furthering uh, terrorism and not uh, bringing it to an end, actually? Well, honestly, I, I'm in favor of the drone program. Um, wars are horrible, and um, troops on the ground are much messier, uh, I think there'd be a lot more civilian casualties if we put an army on the ground. Uh, I don't like the idea of this kind of aerial assassination. And we do cause problems for ourselves, not least of which is that the terrorists now have drones. That's problematic, and we did that. Um, the, uh, but. We don't have an alternative strategy. And um, I think, you know, we have, you know, attrition is, um, is pretty much what we have in our quiver. Um, if you've got a better solution for eliminating members of Al-Qaeda or ISIS, I'd be happy to hear it. Gentleman here. Dan Christman, uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Larry, first of all, I could hear you talk, listen to you talk forever. I, I just, I, I love what you, you have done. Have and <laughs> 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 the, the question uh, concerns the kingdom. You have a chapter I see in your book on Saudi Arabia. You were pessimistic in your comments here to us preliminarily. What's your view? Is there any glimmer of hope with the new generation of leadership with Mohammed bin Salman and his vision 2030 and the attempt to wean away from petroleum and so on. Is there something there in Saudi Arabia that provides you some optimism in their role in this tapestry of evolving terror? Uh, there's an interesting piece in Politico today that Zamil Khalizad, is how you pronounce his name, wrote about his recent trip and how um, the uh, Saudis were opening up and admitting that you know, their strategy of employing Wahhabism as a kind of uh, 
instrument to you know deal with uh, in first case with the Egyptians in the 50s and so on they continually in, enacted in, empowered this this uh, radical group this fundamentalist group in order just to use them as a proxy and uh, now they realize how dangerous that was well that may be just what they were saying to him uh, I often had you know similar uh, seemingly candid conversations that didn't turn out to be prognosis. Um, but I, I, I think it's a good thing that a Saudi Arabia is facing the end of this oil dynasty. And, um, you know, fracking, I think, is probably the, the most... Uh, I remember when... You remember cold fusion, how that lasted for about a day and a half? The panic that hit the Middle East was unbelievable. Free energy, oh my God. Well, fracking is not free, but it uh, at sixty dollars is very profitable. And now, you know, with new technology, uh, even a little bit over forty dollars can make fracking profitable. Uh, that's a long way from a hundred dollars, and uh, for a barrel of oil. And uh, you know, the United States is uh, the the th whether whatever you think about fracking, it has made a profound difference in our relationship uh, to oil producers in the Middle East and I think for the better. Uh, we don't need to be engaged in that kind of dependency and I think the fright of losing all this massive amount of wealth and has caused the kingdom to re-examine its policies and its investments and realize that oil is not going to be the, you know, the, the, the stairway to heaven that it has been in the past. Yet at the same time, they invaded Yemen, which has sort of turned out to be a fiasco. And they yeah. killed Nimr al-Nimr, this leading Shia cleric, seeming right. to sort of, so they seem to be making, it used to be a very conservative foreign policy, and now it's, it's but I guess, I, you know, sort of a follow-up question, which is, you know, the, the Saudis face a paradox, which is Wahhabism, which is essentially the state religion. If you go far enough down that path, yeah. you're going to end up as Osama bin Laden and therefore yeah. become an enemy. But it's so bound up in there, it's been, this alliance has been there since the 18th century. It would be like us sort of suddenly saying, well, you know, the Bill of Rights or some other kind of central pillar of our national consciousness is something we're going to abandon. I mean, so they may intellectually understand Wahhabism is kind of a problem, some, the smarter ones. Right. But uh, I mean, based, you, you live there. Is there any likelihood that they would really do anything significant to say, actually, there's another way of looking at Islam. You know, I've, I've, I'm not Muslim, so I'm going to be no. speaking over my level of ability to understand. But, you know, when Islam came into Arabia in the 7th century, it was a liberalizing force. Mm. And um, there was a, there's a, a word in Arabic, ishtihad, which mm. means independent thinking. Yeah. And um, people were encouraged to think into, and that early period of Islam for about 300 years was full of art and music and, you know, painting. It was a great period in the history of their religion. And then it's around the 10th century, the gates of Ijtihad were closed because yeah. we don't need to know anything else. We got everything. Well, that was a long time ago. And I don't know how practical this is or who could do it, but if someone would say the gates of Ijtihad are open again, I think it would allow a breeze to blow through that religion. Uh, people often talk about the need for reformation, but you know it was it was a reformed religion in its beginning, and it could become so again if only uh, it would be allowed to be. Gentleman here, uh, Scott Walkus. I'm a professor on sabbatical here in D.C. My question is about the differences between ISIS and Al Qaeda, and specifically. Is there a difference in the ISIS ability to manipulate propaganda through social media, video editing? You mentioned a little bit about the Foley beheading video, but it's one of many, as I understand it. And I'm thinking specifically of the uh, book by Stern and Berger about ISIS, where they spend quite a bit of time looking at the use of Twitter and other social media platforms. And uh, what is your perspective? And I'd, I'd be interested to hear from both of you about that. Uh, do you believe ISIS has truly mastered social media in a way that Al-Qaeda never has? 
Oh, I, no I, I can just say yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And Peter has a, an excellent report where he, he talks about how they, you know, the ISIS became the media. And so it's really, I, ref, I recommend that. Lady here. Hi, uh, I'm Maisa Khattab. I'm Egyptian. I used to work in Sudan, so my question is about that country. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on the, pos the recent talks about possibly lifting the sanctions in Sudan and how that might actually impact the ordinary Sudanese uh, in terms of you know, the despair that you were talking about. Um, the people that I used to talk to when I, when I was there were, despite the continuous political activism, they were still very, very pessimistic about uh, al-Bashir. And so can you decapitate you know, the al-Bashir regime, like you were talking about decapitating, you know, a uh, terrorist movement. And would you recommend this for the next U.S. administration? Thank you. Um, well, I certainly don't recommend us decapitating it. You know, uh, right, I, the, um, I think uh, sanctions are a clumsy instrument. But what else do you have? Uh, if you want to affect change in a country that you d whose policies you disagree with uh, and you don't want to do it in a violent way, how do you uh, affect that kind of change? And it, it, it does pun, it's, it's indiscriminate. That's, it's annoying that way. And it's a, it's a way, it's like strangling an individual so that you're know, hoping that the rest of the body would change. And, and uh, but we don't have, in, in this world order that we have, uh, a useful instrument to affect change in oppressive countries. And uh, if the people themselves are not able to do that, then in some respects by keeping in relationship with a tyrant, we've seen again and again, we get blamed for it. We support, we, we held up Mubarak, for instance. You know, it's our fault. And in that region, unfortunately, America gets blamed for almost everything. Um, so no matter what we do, but I, in that case, you know, if there were change effected in Sudan, I think that we should be very responsive to it. And I think it'd be great to bring in, you know, more students, you know, have more exchanges, have, empower young people so that they feel like they can affect change in their own country. And finally, one thing I think that we forget in our country when we talk about American power, we're almost always talking about military power or commercial power. Um, I was in Egypt in 2008, and I made a talk at Cairo University, the same place Obama would later go to make his speech. And um, all these kids were following the American election so avidly. And it was during the primary season. And I asked, you know, so how many of you, if you were able to vote, would vote for Hillary Clinton and all these girls in hijab, you know? And uh, how many for Barack Obama? Nearly everybody else. How many for John McCain? One guy from the embassy. <laughs> 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 but they all were riveted by what was going on in America. I think that those same kids were in Tahrir Square a few months later. And what caused them to go out in the square? I think they were deeply affected by the site of profound social change taking place nonviolently. And they imagined they could do that in their own country. Well, they weren't ready. They weren't organized. They weren't mature enough. They didn't have an agenda. They didn't have a party. They just had an urge. And that wasn't enough. I keep thinking that the Arab Spring is not over. Uh, certainly right now in the Arab world, I think everybody's looked into the abyss. And they've seen you know, how dangerous change can be. So I don't think that we're going to see any resurgence of the Arab Spring anytime soon. But those kids haven't forgotten. And well, one day, I think they'll be the, they'll, as we predicted so long ago, Peter, <laughs> they, will, they will be the end of <laughs> Al Qaeda and ISIS. There's no other way. Well, we want to thank Larry very much. He is uh, more than happy to sign books, I think, uh, after happy this. To, yeah.
Oh, something.